Hi everyone, Kristen DeFrancisco, Assistant Superintendent of Groton Tuscaloosa Regional School District. It never gets old saying that out loud. Um, I wanted to come out to you today and talk a little bit about teacher language for a couple of reasons. Um, first, in our data gathering process through our exit ticket, when you finished your professional development day, one of the items that was identified as something that teachers wanted to learn more about was teacher language. About 28% actually of teachers identified that on the survey. So I wanted to respond to that data by talking a little bit about it today. I also wanted to bring up that it seems that although we've sent out lots of different ways to support goal writing, we may actually have had a little bit of the opposite effect, which was for it to feel supportive to you, it may start be starting to feel a little bit overwhelming for some. So I'm here to say, please don't feel overwhelmed about this goal process. Really writing goals this year that are gonna help you to move through the unprecedented times that we're in to figure out how to maybe make yourself a little bit more efficient at teaching students that are learning at home or something you're doing in the classroom to shift your skill set to teaching students that are socially distanced in the classroom, all of those are, are absolutely fine. And if one of the content areas that we have suggested or supported or that I've logged on helps you to do that, great. Um, and some have asked me, can I just take the goal right off of the sheet that you wrote? Yes, that is not cheating. That is the purpose. Um, so I want to just be here to say, please don't let this be anxiety provoking for you. We know everybody is doing the very, very best that they can. Um, and one of those ways might be to take a look at teacher language um, in building an inclusive learning community. And it might not, but I'm hoping that it either reminds you of something that you have forgotten new once and have now forgotten, or maybe even gives you a focus area. So let's talk a little bit about the power of our words. And as we move through, I will also try to think about ways that I have grown in this area and ways that I still need to grow in this area and share those out along the way. Learning is a language for sure, that teachers have their own language when they work with their students. And we know when we, we apparently twice, are using it effectively because we can, we can see the results. We feel really good about a particular session or class when we've done a really nice job with our language. And so as we talk about teacher language, I always remind myself, and this isn't something that I always did, but I do now remind myself about the expectations we're setting with students. Because in order for our language to work and us to be able to have something for our language to sit on or to be supported by, we need to think about the expectations we have for our students and for ourselves. So what does that mean? Uh, expectations are key. I think that involving your students in those first six weeks of school, which we've talked a lot about, which I'm sure you're still doing now, helps them to be engaged in what they are. Um, and not the ones where you have the conversation, we've all done this, right? We have the conversation and then we take the pre-printed rules from last year and we put them up on the board. Totally guilty of that. Um, you know, ones that really change and morph and you know aren't faded by the end of the year because we've actually maybe revised them. Um, it's not just for the first few days. It's not just for the first six weeks. It's something that we should be referencing all the time. And when we're, when we're using our language, we actually hearken back to the reason why a student might be receiving a reminder or a redirection uh, because we've agreed upon this as a community. Um, and then the revisiting of the learning expectations, it's not just something for the, to establish in those first 30 days of school, those first six weeks of school. On day 100, you should still be thinking about them. Carve out time to reflect on them. Are they still working? Change them if they're not. Um, that will really help set up a, a good foundation for your, um, ex your language, your teacher language. Once you've got that under control um, and you're thinking about the difference between academic and social emotional behavior, um, you know, you, you ask yourself, what are we asking our students to know and be able to do? How are we asking that? And what do learning targets sound like for our students? There's another familiar word, right? Learning targets might be something you're working on this year, being really clear with students. Social and emotional and behavioral, these kind of all fold in together. You know, how are we asking our students to understand what our learning environment should look, feel, and sound like? And are we involving them in the process? These are questions that we can ask ourselves as we're setting ourselves up for success with language. So five things to remember about our language. Being direct and genuine is important. 
Conveying faith in children's intentions and abilities is important. Focusing on action, keeping it brief, and knowing when to be silent. I know my picture is blocking, might block some of the slides, but I like to be able to, um, it helps me as a presenter to be able to see myself oddly enough, and that might not be the case for everybody, but that's why I'm gonna keep it there. Being direct and genuine. So when we say what we mean and we use a kind and straightforward tone, you know, children learn that they can trust us. And why do you want this? Well, obviously, people are going to learn better from those they trust and respect, right? It, it evokes safety. Um, it helps with self-discipline. Um, and so that's the first reason to be direct and genuine. You might choose to say it's time to listen now instead of I see John is listening and Mary is listening. Totally guilty of that. I did that for years in my classroom. Um, but what I've learned is that it really actually can drive a wedge between children because some children might not, not be listening the way they should be because they are unable to or aren't to, haven't built up the capacity yet. And so you want to think about replacing that with a it's time to listen now. Ken, please choose to put Ken, please put your phone away instead of which part of put your phone away is confusing. Totally said it. I admit. It's, you know, thinking the habit of mind of, you know, you want to be able to feel that kind of back and forth with a student, but you also want to say, be able to say directly, I, I need you to put your phone away, put your phone away. If they weren't confused by it, they would have put their phone away, right? So being direct and genuine. Conveying faith in children's abilities and intentions. For the most part, children really do want to do the right thing, and they really do want to have the ability to do that. So saying something and trying languages like, when everyone's ready, I'll show you how to plant the seeds, or I'll show how to plant the seeds. This is knowing, assuming that everybody knows what it looks like to get ready and that you have the ability to be ready. And I'm going to wait until you are. Or you can look at a chart to remind yourself of the ideas for good writing, as opposed to telling them all of the ideas over again. You have a resource for that, and you can look at the chart. And I trust your ability. And I know your intention is to be a better writer. Focusing on action. Um, our students tend to be concrete thinkers. Yes, we want them and have to help them be abstract thinkers, but in order for them to be able to learn and practice that, we also have to be concrete at points in time. So rather than telling children to be respectful, it's probably more helpful to tell them what it looks like. When someone is speaking during a discussion, it's time to listen. That means your eyes are on the speaker and your hands are in your laps. That's respectful. Another example would be rather than telling a student when you produce, when you don't produce work, it makes me think you don't care about your work. I've said it. You might say today, let's see if you can concentrate on your project for 10 minutes. What would help you to do that? So you're not saying to the student, they may care very much about their work. They just might not be able to produce for whatever reason. So thinking on the action that you want students to do. Keeping it brief. When needing to get a point across, students need to understand that first sentence, right? If we go on, they've lost you. Sentence four, they're gone. What are you asking me to do, Mrs. DeFrancisco? Just get to the point. Rather than saying, when you are researching today, make sure that you're citing your sources properly because yesterday when I was reading through papers, most of them did not have appropriate citings and that made me feel on and on and on. Try saying, can anyone remind us where to find the resource to help you with your sightings in your research work, because I want everybody to do that today. Apparently a lot, because I wrote today twice on my slide deck. Um, so shifting that language a little bit to keep it brief. Know when to be silent, very hard for me. <laughs> this might be the hardest one. Uh, appropriately play silent allows students to think. Some students need to rehearse what they want to say, some adults do too, and then some need to gather the courage to say it. Okay. Three to five seconds can seem really long with like this pregnant pause. But if we commit this to students, we'll start to get used to having the pause. And if we're intentional about it and explain it, they'll even begin to want it. So labeling this as a three to five question, which means I'm waiting. I'm waiting five full seconds before I call on anybody. Um, will help students start to know, okay, I have time to think of what I want to say and rehearse it and be brave enough to say so. So those are just elements and things we can do with our language. 
three kinds of language we can use regularly in our practice are reinforcing, reflecting, and reminding. And yes, this does come from responsive classroom, and I know that tends to be associated with younger students. This is great language for everybody, K to 12. Reinforcing language is probably the most important, and it's the first kind of language at our disposal as teachers. It's very powerful, and it's the longest kind of language, it's the longest, most words that we would say would be during reinforcing language. Okay, it should be specific. You are meeting the goal of today's lesson. I feel that way because you're trying lots of different ideas for solving that problem. That takes persistence. Is a whole lot different than, oh, good job. Oh, I like what I see. It's specific. It talks about the goal of the lesson. Um, it reinforces what you want students to do. And I guarantee you, you use this kind of lesson, they're gonna do these things again. Feels good to get that feedback from a teacher. Sometimes, though, you need to remind. No matter how much we reinforce, our students will need reminders. Uh, we will find ourselves kind of going back and forth between that reminding and reinforcing language. So if I was taking this to more of the behavior set, I might say one of our expectations is to listen when others are talking, and Sarah is talking right now. I'm reminding you, essentially, that you really do need to uh, be quiet while someone else is talking. If I were to think about this reminding language with my last example, I might say, I see that you've only solved that problem one way. I'm reminding you that part of our goal in our lesson was to solve it a couple of ways. And then they're reminded to go back and take a look at that problem again. And sometimes you get to redirecting language. Notice this is the shortest one. When the dance between reinforcing and reminding language isn't working, some students just need to hear, I need, need to be put back on the right path. Stop talking, please. You're redirecting them and you're asking them to, to stop whatever behavior and get back on track. You know, I need you to look at a diff three more ways to do that problem. It's the most brief um, because you really just want to redirect them and move on. It doesn't have to be about shaming. It doesn't need to be about, not that I suggest anybody would do that. It doesn't need to be a, this big, long reason why. Stop talking, please. So those three R's, reinforcing, use it a lot. Reminding, use it when reinforcing isn't working. And then finally redirecting because sometimes students just need to hear it. Whoa, that feels like a lot. But I think in small steps, this is one teacher move that can lead to an inclusive learning community. Um, I hope it act as a, acted as a reinforcing presentation that reinforces you if you're using this kind of language and maybe as a reminder that, oh yeah, I know, I know I should be thinking about those things. This would be a way to build an inclusive learning community. Maybe that's my professional goal this, this year. I'm gonna work on my teacher language. Simple enough, small steps, small chunks, lots of great action steps to go along with that that I'd be happy to talk about if anyone would want to engage in that conversation. So I hope this has um, answered some of those or, or fulfilled some of that need for those 28% of the people that talked a little bit about wanting to know more about teacher language. We certainly can do more asynchronous PD around this, but here is a start. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. I appreciate all that you're doing. And please know, I know everyone's doing the best they can do with what they've got. And that's the most important thing. Thanks for watching.